You say we're one in Jesus, but we still fight amongst Christians. But MBN, it's our mission to spread love and show you vision. And we cancel our division. And we hope that you listen. Cause Mom Laka broke us, network brings you love. Enjoy and love, enjoy. We cancel out the noise and we giving you a voice. Gives you love, enjoy and love, enjoy. We cancel out the noise and we giving you a voice. Gives you love. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ambassador Veronique Lawson. On behalf of Mamlaka Brokers Network, or how we call it, MBN, we would like to say welcome to you and thank you for tuning in this morning. Today, we are joined by two panelists from the beautiful island of, the, of Bahamas, the place where God lives. Our panelist is Ambassador Rene Johnson, and Lady Priya. Our panelists today will be answering a question, which is kind of a very sensitive issue that is happening actually in the church today. Is the church and its leader equipped to deal with this type of matter? So sit back, get out your Bible, and hear for yourself what our panelists have to say. My first question will be to Lady Priya. Can you tell us and the viewer around the globe a little bit more about yourself and what you went through or how you went through or even going through still? The floor is yours, Lady Priya. Good morning, hope all is well. So I am firstly a work in progress. I am, um, I want to say a mixture between healing and discovering. I have experienced a lot of things and I have put them together to tell my story. So I'm 34 years old. I am a resident of the beautiful island of the Bahamas. I am the eldest of four children and I'm self-employed. I have experienced a lot of, I would think to say discrimination in some sorts within the church. I feel that um, on the topic of marriage in particular, I think that we have a obligation to do the work beforehand. So I think that if you and a person decide that we're gonna get married and we wanna spend the rest of our life together, we could do counseling, we can do what we have to do as a couple to make sure that we are ready to make that step. So with that being said, I want it to be known that once you do the proper research and you are equipped with background knowledge on what the marriage comprises of and you follow that guideline, then you are able to move forward in love and forgiveness. Now, what my topic or issue is with the church and sensitivity is abuse within the household, domestic abuse, childhood abuse. I feel that in certain instances, when a person involved in an abusive situation feels as, that, as though they are at the wit's end and they come to the church wanting the marriage to work or not knowing which direct direction they should take. I feel it's more times that the abuser is sided with and the victim is given options to stay around and degrade their mental health in order to make a situation work. My platform is more or less about mental health and mental wealth. And I feel that there are so many different components in order to be a successful person that we have to put effort into making sure that those different areas are taken care of. So even though I want to come to my pastor and I want to talk to him about what's going on spiritually with me, 
I feel that he has to be equipped to assist in every other area. We have physical, wellness, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual, environmental, occupational. There's so many different elements that comprise one's well-being that you can't just tell someone, go to this scripture. So what I experienced was being in a situation where ultimately you're unhappy, you're at your wit's end, and you really want a solution. The first problem is when there's one person coming in to assist with this problem that two people need to be a part of the solution with. So we already at a disadvantage when there's only one person coming in to the church. You're only hearing one side of that person's story and it's hard for you to relay that message to the person that is not present. So I feel that the person that is present, they are mostly told by the church, this is a spiritual battle. Satan is against marriages. You have to hold on to this marriage. You have to fast. You have to pray. You have to anoint yourself, anoint your spouse, anoint your dwelling. You have to put down any thoughts of leaving the marriage because something I realized that's a very popular saying in the churches, God hates divorce. And this is true. This is scriptural evidence that it said, but it's the context. It's my interpretation that God does not like the grieving and the pain associated with divorce. But at the end of the day, he created us all as his creatures to be loved and cherished. The entire purpose of marriage is to love and honor your spouse. There's the sixth commandment that states that we should not commit adultery. I feel as though once you go against what the vow stated that you took when you decided to go with the person, you are now null and void of having such a big role in that person's life. I feel that if the person that's being abused feels as though there's an issue, they should be able to have it addressed and move on from it in a positive way. Now, what I've realized is that in my opinion, Females, they normally get the lesser end of the stick. For example, if a man was to go and have a child outside of his marriage, they would convince the wife that it's okay. You can raise the child together. The child is not the sin. The act was the sin. Forgive your spouse and let's move on. If the female were to get pregnant, there would be no discussion. There would be total exile, and there are even places in the world that you you can lose your life for just committing an act like that. So where I see the double standard is in situations with abuse, mental, physical, adultery, when it's a male involved versus a female, I feel that the female is encouraged to lessen and lose her standards and therefore it creates a mental decline. I feel that when you go to the church to seek spiritual advice, once you've already noticed that this person's mental health is in jeopardy, they're depressed, their self-esteem is dwindling. If you are not equipped, certified, licensed to mm -hmm. give that person the tools and advice to help them psychologically, I feel it is your duty in the church to refer them to someone that can assist. Besides that, I feel that um, some of the things that I've heard personally and that people had to experience is, for example, when you get married in your mind, you're going to have these kids, you're going to have a family. It doesn't work out that way. So when you don't have the child, the burden is more on you because every time someone sees you, it's when you're going to give your husband a child, what you waiting on to have kids? So when that man goes out there and has a child, they expect you to understand that. But I feel that when a person makes a commitment to you, it should be for you and what you come with flaws and all. If you're not able to reproduce, they should still be able to accept you in that state or leave you alone. I don't think a person should be able to tell you, hey, you need to accept me having an outside child and bringing it to you because you haven't had one for me. I feel that the church uses divorce as a form of captivity to stay with the capture. 
Um, when I say that, I mean, let's say you as a spouse have been trying to relate to your spouse that you are trying, you're unhappy, but you would like that person to help with the process of healing. They're not interested. You go and you talk to your pastor, you talk to someone about it. And they basically tell you that you have to fight against whatever it is that you're going through. Now, if they do advise you to have space from that person for a while, which is very rare, if that other spouse decides to move on during that process, you're still at fault. Because what I was told and what I've heard is once you leave your spouse during the healing process, whatever they do is ultimately your fault because you should have never left. Now, if we are using the biblical principles as an individual, self-preservation is a must. And we should be in a position where our cups runneth over. So if my cup is empty and I am dried as a human being, I then have nothing left to give. I then cannot live my purpose. I cannot be who God put me on the earth to be because now I am running on fumes. Just because I am trying to stay committed to this vow that I took and I am doing it now on my own when it was meant to be a team effort. We go to these pastors looking for spiritual advice. We go looking for assistance so that it can get better. But I feel if you have already expressed to your church members, your pastor, that I am severely abused. I am at a mental decline. I don't know I can take any more of this. I feel that you are now an abuser when you tell me that it's my obligation as a spouse to stay when this person is not adhering to the covenant and the vow that they took in the presence of God to treat their spouse how Christ loved the church or in a um, aspect with the wife, the wife is supposed to honor and respect and be submissive to her husband. Submissiveness also comes from love. We shouldn't force each other to do these things. It should come naturally and it should be a team effort. But when it is forced and when it's not a team effort, I feel that is when the problem comes in and that's when it's one-sided and one person experiences more than the other. So, Continue, yes. continue. So, anything else you'd like me to share on that? Um. Thank you very much, Lady Priya, for um, sharing your heart and pour out really what you went through and how you actually uh, expect the leaders of the church to deal with the situation. From your hearing, uh, I, I, I hear that um, there's a physical, there is a mental, and there is emotional and there is a spiritual part, and there is also um, many parts that play the role in it. So uh, we could not just uh, be as the leaders of the church, just touching one single part, which is more spiritual. And so I thank you very much for that, for, for pouring out your heart. And now I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Ambassador Rene. Uh, did you have anything to add on that? Thank you so much. I think she kind of covered, you know, most of the bases. And um, what I would like to add, though, is we're at the point in the precipice in the church as leaders, as ambassadors for the kingdom. We are mandated to respond. And our response has to be to the point where it's intimate sometimes, where there are sensitive issues. There are times when we must do it in, I guess, in collaboration. So you have to do it in a collaborative effort. And um, no one man or no one person, no one leader has all the answers. And as Priya was saying, there were times when she trusted that someone or the person she confided in, the person who was the leader the person who is in charge, the, the, the pastor, which is a pastor, you're supposed to pastor your sheep. 
and being a sheep, she was at the point where she needed pastoring. And it appeared that this individual and a lot of individuals aren't equipped. They're not equipped and they don't ask for help. And there are times when you need to pass the baton on, not necessarily in um, a demise or the time of retirement. There are times that necessarily dictates this, you know what, this is bigger than me. Maybe I may have to call my wife. Maybe I can have her speak to myself and my wife. And so those are the times we need to do. And I, I think that what you just add into this discussion is very, is very uh, relevant. Um, even as the, the, the word teach us that uh, um, we have many gifts in the body of Christ. And so sometimes uh, a leader of the church may think that because he's a leader, then uh, he has a whole responsibility or that he could deal with everything that comes around because he's the leader. And sometimes he or she, they, they forsake the point that there may be some people in his leadership team or in her leadership team who mm -hmm. are better qualified to address the issue that uh, some of the congregants may, may be going through, namely this issue right now, because it's really sensitive what uh, uh, Lady Bria went through. And as she was uh, actually exposing that, uh, or, or, or uh, responding on it with the physical, with the emotional, and with the mental. I mean, you, 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 could not, you could not take everything and say, okay, you know, you have the scripture. When somebody is actually mentally abused or when somebody is actually physically, physically abused or when somebody is actually, uh, let's say, um, emotionally abused, you could not just say, okay, you know, take the scripture and, 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 and go read it. It just remind yeah. me, this remind me of, uh, of the best Samaritan. I mean, this is what I could see, the, the, the scripture, the best Samaritan. Uh, some we often sometimes overread that scripture, but we don't know, we do not understand the depth of it that he first poured the oil before he tried to heal the womb. He just I, I just wanted to say that he just he first poured the oil before he yeah. tried to heal mm -hmm. the womb. So it, it, it kind of telling you that you know it's not always only the word of God, but it's also how people have to approach an issue and how. And as she said. And we kind of now understanding that there are many of such leaders who are not really best qualified to deal with certain issue. And therefore they have to uh, 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 call or they have to uh, uh, say, okay, um, let's see, maybe uh, we could actually uh, uh, go this route or we could go that route. And then uh, so that to keep the person um, uh, in the trust of the law. So now I will go back again uh, to Lady Priya, Lady Priya, sorry for your name. Can you again, please uh, tell us more? I know that you have a, a lot in you. So I just wanted to hear more about uh, 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 I, I just wanted to hear really uh, when you went through. I know you have more to say. So I'll give you the floor again one more time. Okay, so someone that has always played a pivotal role in my life from a child is Dr. Miles Monroe. And he said one of his quotes, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Mm -hmm. I actually side with abusers because there are traumas that those persons have experienced and the healing process is a painful and scary one. And lots of people aren't prepared to open those wounds to start the process of healing. But that does not give them the right to hurt other people because they are hurting. So when you are in a situation when you love someone, let me just say, first of all, love covers a multitude of sin, but love does not discredit abuse. Love is kind, love is patient. And although we speak about forgiveness, in order to forgive, there must be an offer of repentance. Repentance is changed action. You cannot just keep encouraging someone to go back home to the same abusive environment when the person is not repentative. I don't even know if that's a word, but the point is, <laughs> I want to be certain that we establish abuse is not okay on any level. 
it is possible that you too could be Christians and still be unequally yoked. Abuse doesn't necessarily come in only a physical form. We could just not understand each other and therefore our quality of life declines daily because we're not able to fully enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. When you get in a marriage, although it's not just fun, it's, it's supposed to be two people pouring out love to each other, growing spiritually, helping. The actual marriage is a covenant itself that is supposed to be looked at as a goal in life to aspire to achieve something so that cool. so is cool. positive and that you would want to be a part of. So if you're not displaying that, then you should not be a part of it. So the thing about trauma bonds, enabling and different forms of abuse is that most times you don't even know what's happening. So when you go looking for assistance, you are already mentally unstable because you really don't know what's going on with you. And it's a reality shock that you, you weren't expecting. So when you go to someone and you're telling them, this is what I'm experiencing. And then the person is telling you, well, just pray about it. Go to the Lord in prayer. You cannot, you have to use actions. And that is the purpose mm -hmm. for therapists and psychologists. And that is the reason schools were developed so that people can assist in other facets of life. So if I'm telling you that I've tried the praying, I've tried the crying, I've tried the fasting, I've tried the anointing, and this individual that is responsible for their life, they're not willing to do this, then you have to give me advice to preserve my mind so that I don't. Right. And that's why Jesus said, when he said that going into all the war, therapy is a war. So many people, they, 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 they kind of just living that for the people who are in this world. But therapy or, or, or going to a therapy, I mean, if you have someone in the body of Christ who is a great therapist, then the person is working in his gift or she is working in her gift. Yeah. So when something like that happens, they will not, okay, we all, oh, we have in this congregation, uh, this doctor who is a therapist. So please, we will hand you over, we will hand your situation or we will ask you to go to that person so that the person will better assist you because the pastor may not know at all as, as uh, he is a pastor, okay, or she is a pastor, but they have people. Now, if the congregation is void of those, then yeah. there is a problem. Really, many congregations are void of those gifting because mm -hmm. they have a tendency of just going to pastoral, 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 or they want to just go to evangelist, 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 and they forsake that little, little gift, which are all a part of the body. So I'm, um, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you bring that one up, and I will give you again the floor to continue, Lady Prayer. Okay, so I feel... You want her to continue? Yeah, yeah, she could continue. Okay. Yeah, so I feel like one of the biggest problems are the actual opinions and thoughts about marriage and divorce. There are some people that are totally against divorce, no matter what. So I feel as though as a victim, you also have to be sensitive as to who you are going to for advice. If you feel that you and this person's biblical doctrine don't line up, then you now have to put, place yourself in some place that is going to be beneficial for your healing. Because just because your interpretation is that I don't believe in divorce at all, that doesn't mean that I should stay there because you don't believe in that. Also, I'm not saying that divorce is the first option, but I feel that both parties should be willing and able to come forward to put in the effort when it's one person, to me, the marriage is already over. Because if the other party had wanted the marriage as badly as the other party, both persons would have been a part of it. So I'm just saying that my experience was disappointing because I thought that you would love me as a human being before someone's wife. I thought that my mental health and that my self-esteem and my pride would have been a priority and that you would have wanted the best for me. And there's also stigma associated with divorce. And to me, that is reminiscent of the prodigal child because 
although the prodigal child went back, his father opened his arms and gave him the best. But the brother still felt like, why is he accepted? And that's, to me, also a stigma in the church. Let's say you do move on from a member that's in the church and you decide to carry on. There are certain people that feel like you shouldn't even feel worthy to still attend because you're now a divorcee. You're in a different category. You're not the same level. And these are things that are happening presently and currently when we are supposed to hold people and love them. For example, the shepherd that had 100 sheep and one went missing. Although he had 99, he could have been happy and comfortable with that, but he still went out and seek that one sheep exactly. because we're supposed to just be concerned about our brothers and sisters, one soul. That is all we're supposed to be concerned about, not associating who they're still with or who they're not. So trauma comes from all forms and desperate people do desperate things. And it's also a spiritual battle. Yes, people say, Satan came to steal, kill, destroy. That's biblical. And they use it in a reference to say against marriage. But yeah. at the end of the day, we have to preserve our souls as well. And um, we can't just keep saying, because Satan is against marriage, we have to keep sticking to it. No, it's supposed to be healthy. It's supposed to be a commitment. And both people are supposed to work towards the same goal. So true. So true, so true. And, and, and then I could chime in and, and say that many people focus on the subject, marriage, then focus yeah, yeah. on the relationship in it. Because if we just see always the big picture, but we don't see the detail, it was a, God sees always a detail. Is this relationship healthy? Is this relationship um, um uh, biblically sound is 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 it is it really what I God required? And I am merciful. I am loving. I am I am forgiving. So He says it in His Word. You know, I I, I have it. I have it. I have a, a, a tendency to always hear people just picking the word out of the context and trying to apply it somewhere, and they 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 take the word out of the context and they apply it somewhere so when when I, what i'm hearing here is that they focus more on yeah you should not divorce but they don't focus on your mental they don't focus on your human being on your whole being or your well-being they don't focus on that so if if the guy is beating you or if the guy is uh, is um, uh, molesting you or whatever word that they, they don't focus on that and once you have jumped that step because you wanted to be saved and save your body and save and be and be how do I say save your sanity if I may say it so then you are for the short <clears throat> people like an, an outcast but God right. does not cast anyone out yes. none of us none of us God's always pick up and I like that and, and I like that illustration that you you brought in with, with the prodigal song even though he was the one who left but once he came back the father was the first one to come and embrace. This show us how the love of God is so deep. So to just say, I would like Ambassador Rene to chime in. Yes, and as she was talking, something came to my memory. I remember when I was, her father and I, we were in a, what do you call it, common law marriage. Um, for the same reason, I saw some things that I refused to, um, sign up for and so we went for counseling and I always remember we went to this church and as we sat and I'm saying to them what I'm experiencing I'm saying to them you know he pays all the bills we have the housekeepers we have a nice home we have everything that a woman would want I said but he is not doing some of the things that I believe I mean I should have Yes, he's proposed to me, but I don't want to marry him because there are some things that I don't like. And I said, can you please address it so he could know what we ought to do as a unit? And the pastor said to me, and I'll never forget it. He said to me, he said, do you know how much women, women would love to be in your shoe? You say he pays, he pays the bills. You said he's, he's taking care of the kids. He said, miss. 
you need to relax and realize that's just how some men are. And I walked out of there deflated because I was in shock. And you know what he did to him? He put his hand on his shoulder and he said to him, now don't forget to put something in the offering box. And when we came out of that room, you know what he said to me? You could even bribe the pastor. And to date, I don't look at that pastor the way I thought men should be pastors, leaders should be looked at. Then there was another incident. I had somebody preach in the church I used to go to. He anointed me. Um, everybody in the church, he really anointed. He's an anointed speaker. And we have to also be careful, too, that people could show signs that they are anointed and appointed. But if their life doesn't line up, and um, my girlfriend had introduced me to him for some counseling, and, and I said I needed to go away to get some stuff from my store. I, I never drive, drove in the U.S. at that time. So we went there, and I went there, and I met him, and he was really nice, and he, you know, he's talking to me and all of that. And he started asking me questions about, what well, do you, you think uh, you'd ever marry a pastor? I said, well, I don't see that in my future. I said, but if God has it for me, yes. I said, it'll happen. So I'm thinking he's walking me through the healing. And so he said, Renee, you know, I'm just going to give you a gift. He got a nice little motel. It wasn't nothing expensive. And there was two beds in there. And he goes, you know, tomorrow you want to make an early start. So I'll get up early and we can do what you have to do. And I'm trusting him because I'm feeling good because he's saying things to me that I need to hear. The healing has begun. Long and the short of it was I get up through the night to go to the bathroom and here he is unclothed and I'm in shock. So I'm just saying that we need to recognize what we need to do as leaders. Talking about healing. We'll be right back to you. Thank Great. you. Talking about healing. Stay tuned. 